Well, you know how in the past you have learned, starting way back in elementary school, you learned how to add things together and then they taught you how to reverse that by subtracting. Then they taught you how to multiply and then they taught you how to reverse that by dividing. Then they taught you how to square something. Then they taught you to square root it. So they're forever teaching you how to do something and then teaching you how to reverse it or how to undo it. And so now we are going to learn how to reverse a derivative. So now that we've learned how to take a derivative, we've learned the product rule, the quotient rule, power rule, chain rule. We've learned how to apply them to optimization, to related rates, to curve sketching. We've learned a lot about derivatives. Now we're going to learn how to reverse them. And it's called, when it's first introduced to you, it's called an anti-derivative. So anti meaning like against. Okay, so we're going to learn how to take an anti-derivative. Now, let's just kind of start off talking about how this sort of works. So if I just had and said this was the derivative of something, and I want you to find the original function. So would you be willing to... To just let me write this down for just a second and say, okay, I I think maybe it's this. So let's let's check. Okay, if I started with x squared plus three x and took the derivative, would I get back to two x plus three? And the answer is yes. Now we don't want to guess, and, and intuition is great, you know, for certain circumstances and when you're stuck. <laughs> Okay, but we really kind of need a method and, and kind of something we can depend on. And sadly, at this point in time, the only thing you have going for you is we can reverse the power rule. But there's no clear way to reverse the quotient rule or the product rule. There's kind of a way in the future to, it is the chain rule in reverse, but it doesn't necessarily look like that. Um, but it's, it just has to start somewhere. So what we're going to do is start with the power rule. But you may be kind of glad we're not going to reverse the quotient rule. So that's good. And so here we go. Now, some books call the, and, and this is very confusing when they do that. So some books will tell you that if I tell you that this is F, can you find capital F, which is the original function? And for a lot of students and for some teachers, including me, this just gets me like kind of lost in this. Wait, where are we going? Because <laughs> I'm used to this one being the original function and we take the derivative of it. I'm not used to F being titled of the derivative. And so if your book does that, I, I have great sympathy for you that that. This is going to make your head just kind of do like this. And so um, my book that I used at the end for the students, and I did not use it, um, did use this technique with the capital F. And so I would just tell the students, I go, for me, just put a prime right there and call this F. And then they would all go, oh, okay, all right, I can do that. And and I on my test, I did it the way they're used to as opposed to with a book. The way the book says. All right. So sometimes you just have to adapt it. You may not be bothered by the fact that capital F is the original function and now little f is the derivative. But if it is bothering you, you just have to figure a way around. Now let's let's see if we can kind of come up with a rule. Let's talk about the power rule. So do you remember that when we did the power rule, we would take the deriv the derivative. We would take the power, bring it down in front to multiply. Okay, so what's the reverse of to multiply? Well, it's to divide. So we're going to divide somehow. We'll figure that out in just a second. And then we would take one away from the power, right? And we would say, okay, two minus one is this one right up here, right? So what we did is we took one away from the power and we also multiplied by the original power, right? So to reverse, we're going to divide somehow, and we're going to add one somehow. So let's see if we can figure that out, okay? So let's try f prime of x is 8x plus 3. Let's try a new one, okay? 
So if we tried this, okay, let's add 1 to the power. So we'd have 8x. We had a 1. We add 1 to the power because before we subtracted 1. So the opposite of that is to add 1. And we're going to divide by the new power, which is actually 2. Okay, so this would give us 8x squared over 2, which is 4x squared. Now, let's check. Would the derivative of 4x squared get me back up there to 8x? Yes, it would. Okay, so it seems like what we're doing, and this is what we're doing, we're going to add 1 to the power right here, and we're going to divide by the new power. Okay, so remember what we did before is we brought the power down to multiply and we subtracted 1. So now we're going to add 1 and divide by the new power. So let's go back here and try it again. Now, for this 3, there's certain things that you sort of knew when you did a derivative before. If you had f of x was equal to 3x, its derivative was just 3, right? So you knew that... you. You know, we didn't necessarily do the bring the 1 down and multiply and then take 1 away from it, though that's actually what was going. People just sort of memorize that the derivative of 3x is a 3, the x just disappears. Well, if you have a 3, you're going to bring the x back. Okay, so you now remember we have 8x. Add 1 to the power, divide by the new power, so that'd be 2 plus 3. And if it's a constant now, it must have had an x before. So this would be what I think the new derivative is. Okay? Or at least that's what I can reconstruct. And you can always check, right? You can always sit there and say, if I take the derivative of that, what I get back, which is kind of nice on this test when your teacher has a test for you. Now, the problem with this is, okay, is let's think for just a second and look at this 4x squared plus 3x. Its derivative is 8x plus 3, right? Its derivative is this. However, if it was 4x squared plus 3x, let's say, plus 2, its derivative is that because the derivative of a constant is 0. If it was 4x squared plus 3x minus 1, its derivative is that because the derivative of a constant is 0. And you could do this all day long. You know, f of x is 4x squared plus 3x plus 5 halves. Again, its derivative is the same one because the constant disappears because the derivative of a constant is 0. So it could literally be any constant here that you can think of, right? You remember back when you learned transformations and you would have y is equal to x squared and you would say, okay, that was the parabola. And then you could transform it by, um, you had things like the number that adds or subtracts on the outside moves it up or down. So this is up to, and so this one would come up to. And if it was y is equal to x squared minus 3, this would be down 3. Should be down here. Remember transformations? So this was your family function and you can move it up and down by adding and subtracting. Well, this is your family function here, right up here. And you are moving it up two, down one, up five halves, or any other constant, right? So it would be like this. Okay, so here's 4x squared plus 3x in various positions. All right. So it would be really kind of technically inaccurate if we just said that the original function was 4x squared plus 3x right here because it could be a constant that we didn't see, all right, or are not aware of. So what you have to put on there is that the function is 4x squared plus 3x plus some unknown constant that I don't know right at the moment. Okay? And it's so important 
that if, let's say, this was a five-point question on a test, if you didn't put the plus C on there in my class, you get two points taken off because you have eliminated this entire family set of an infinite set of possibilities that could be higher or lower than this base family function, all right? So don't forget the plus C. Now, what we're going to focus on is we're going to focus on the, the power rule for a little while, right? So let's try a few more. So if you have f prime of x is equal to 6x cubed plus 3x squared minus 4x plus 9. Okay, now you may choose to stop the video and give it a try yourself and then see or just watch. But we're going to go through our process and we have a 6 and then we have our x. You add 1 to the power, so 3 plus 1 is 4, and you divide by the new power, plus 3, x. Add 1 to the power, divide by the new power, minus 4, x. Now this is an understood 1, so we're going to add 1 to the power, and we're going to divide by the new power, plus 9. And since this is a constant, it used to have an x with it. And if it did have a constant, I don't know what it is now because the derivative of a constant is zero. So I put in my placekeeper saying, and there's some constant, it could be zero. The constant could be zero, but I don't know that it is. So there's my reminder that right now I have a whole family of functions, possibilities. Then I clean it up. Okay, so six and four become three halves. X to the fourth plus three over three is one. So you have x cubed minus 2 goes into 4 twice. So you have 2 x squared plus 9x plus c. And like I mentioned earlier, the beauty of this part, the part I always looked forward to taking tests like these, is you can actually check your work before you turn it in. So just take a minute and look back up here. If you take the derivative of this f that you just found, okay, would you get 6x cubed plus 3x squared minus, I lost somebody, 3x cubed, is it? no, sorry, 3x squared minus 4x to the first, I can't even read my own writing apparently, all right, plus 9, all right, so what do you think, did you get it? And yes, you did, okay, so this is my answer, all righty. Now let's try another one. So if f prime of x is equal to minus 12x to the fourth minus 5x cubed plus 8x squared plus 3x plus 7. And you can skip as many of these steps as you want. Students always say, how many can I skip? And I go as many as you can do accurately in your head. But if you're wrong, there's no partial credit because I don't see any partial work. So we have negative 12 x. Add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. Minus 5 x. Add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. Plus 8 x. Add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. Plus 3 x. Add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. Plus 7, and if it's a constant now, it did have an x. And don't forget the constant you can't retrieve at the moment. So you'd have negative 12 fifths x to the fifth minus 5 fourths x to the fourth plus 8 thirds x cubed plus 3 halves x squared plus 7x plus c. Okay. And then you should always go and say, if I take the derivative of that, would I get the, the derivative that was given to you? Now, sometimes students check, okay? And they'll go, okay, so here's my check. And they'll go, okay, bring the five down. They cancel, this is minus 12x, take one from the power, minus five x cubed, plus 8x squared, plus 3x, plus 
7 and the derivative of a constant is 0 and they leave that there right and I'm like okay you just undid what you just did but it's the last thing in the problem statement so you can't fault the teacher for going this is the last thing you told me so this is wrong okay <laughs> because now you've just worked your way back to the beginning now you can check but what I would suggest you do if you're going to put that down right down there is that you label this check and I have to get this down front if I can get my fractions and that you box this in because students sometimes get really cranky with teachers and sometimes we deserve it sometimes we don't okay but when you're not making it clear what you want them to grade well you know you really you can try to hold it against them but you don't have anything to stand on okay so if you're going to check it right underneath it please box in the one you want the teacher to grade and label the other one as your check okay also sometimes some students ask me is it okay I'm going to take this check out for just a second. Is it okay if I write it minus 12x to the 5th over 5 minus 5x to the 4th over 4 plus 8x cubed over 3 plus 3x squared over 2 plus 7x plus c? And yes, it is. Half the time when I'm not um, being watched either in class or on a video, mine kind of go back and forth and I use both sometimes in the same equation. Okay. But yes, but some software systems, if you're using automated homework grading, you know, want the uh, coefficient out in the front. Some don't. Some don't care. Some teachers have a preference. All right. So let's try one with fractional exponents. And yes, this works for fractions. It works for negative powers with one kind of it still works, but it's got a different solution for one exception. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. All right, so here's fractional exponents, and some of y'all may be already kind of scrunching up your eyes and going, mm, I don't like fractions. Well, most of us are not as comfortable with fractions as we are with integers because we don't work with them as often on a daily basis, but you can do this, okay? So same rule. So the original function might have been some version of x. So we have two-thirds. We're going to add one to it, all right? Now, depending on your comfort level, all right, we're going to put some steps in here. And you can leave out or modify the steps as you see fit. Now, two-thirds plus one is actually two-thirds plus three-thirds. So that's five-thirds, right? And we're going to divide by the new power. Okay? Minus 2x. We have 1 fifth plus 1. And 1 fifth plus 1 is 1 fifth plus 4 plus 5 fifths. Okay? So this is going to be 6 fifths. And you're going to divide by 6 fifths plus 3x. Minus 4 plus 1 is minus 3 plus C, right? Now, to divide by a fraction, you multiply by its reciprocal, right? Remember when you used to have something like 2 thirds divided by 5 thirds was 2 thirds times, and you would flip this 5 thirds, okay? So to divide by 5 thirds is the same thing as multiplying by 3 fifths. We have 4 times three-fifths x and remember two-thirds plus one was this five-thirds okay minus two times and to divide by six-fifths is to multiply by five-sixths x to the five six-fifths and plus three and minus three cancel so you have minus x to the minus five minus 3. I can add minus 3 <laughs> plus C. I'm, I've got a window and I'm looking out the window and, and I just got distracted. Sorry about that. Some things happen outside windows. All right, here we go. So you'd have this 4 times 3 fifths is 12 fifths x to the 5 thirds. 
minus, let's see, 2 goes into 6 three times, so you'd have 5 thirds x to the 6 fifths minus x to the minus 3 plus c, and this is your original, I think, f of x. I'm going to live with that and go with that. Remember, you can check this by taking the derivative and seeing if you get that up there. And then it's not like I'm going to live with this one. That is the solution. Okay. Now, quick comment. Remember how in the past, anything with a negative exponent, you were normally supposed to um, make it be a non-negative exponent and you would put it down on the other side of the fraction bar or put it up if it was on the bottom and then drop the negative. But as I pointed out in the earlier derivative ones, considered kind of standard good form is if it started off with a negative exponent up here, it's okay to leave it with a negative exponent. Now your teacher may disagree and your teacher may override what's considered kind of good form. Okay and say, no, I don't want any negative exponent answers, or the computer program you're entering in your computation to for online graded homework or tests may say it wants non-negative exponents. And so, you know, this would be one over x cubed. Okay, so the one with the red pen wins, whether it's a computer program or whether it's your teacher, if either one of them says that they want non-negative exponential answers then you would leave it as 1 over x cubed but if there's but if it's considered the good form of i return the answer to the questioner in the same form they asked it then being asked about it with a negative exponent says i'm going to return it to you as a negative exponent okay now just a comment that's why you know, hopefully when you attend lectures or watch the lectures online, they show you the format that they want. All right. Now, the one exception that's kind of like, um, what are we going to do here, is what if we have 6, I'm just making this up, 6x to the negative 1. Okay. So if we were going to do the standard approach, we'd have 6x. We'd add 1 to the power, and we would divide by the new power. But the problem with this is, is I don't mind 6x to the 0 so much because x to the 0, anything to the 0 power is just 1. But we do have a problem with dividing by 0, because that's not allowed, right? Because this wouldn't, you can't have 0 in the denominator. It's a restriction on the domain and everything. So do you remember... Because this could also be written as 6 over x, right? Do you remember, I'll try to get these down here where you could see them about the right time, and it looks like I made it. Do you remember that when we took the derivative of the natural log, we got 1 over x? So one of the things you have to commit to memory, all right, is to reverse that, is... If I have six, if I have six over x, one over x, three over x, negative two over x, if I have an x in the bottom or an x to the minus one, which is x in the bottom, then it must have originally been a natural log. See, because the derivative of a natural log gives you one over x. So all of these forms over here, remember we mostly focused on this one these two. And as of now, we don't have any way to do this loop back in like we did on the chain rule. We'll come up with that shortly before the end of all of this derivatives, not in this video, but like three or four videos down the road. But right now we're just dealing with x. It's just like what we did when we started off with derivatives and we only used x because we didn't know the chain rule. So we can't do that. So likewise, like you have to remember those, you're going to have to recommit to memory and be able to back up something that goes like this. If the derivative of sine is cosine, and I give you cosine and say it's the derivative of something, you have to mentally go, if, it was the, if the derivative is cosine, the original function must have been sine. If the derivative is secant squared, the original function must have been tangent. So you're going to have to relearn these and be able to go backwards, okay? So if f prime of x 
is 6x to the minus 1. Hopefully, you look at it and go, oh, that wait, that's 6 over x. And any time I have denominator of x, that's the natural log. But if not, okay, if plus c, okay. But if not, what's going to happen is when you do this adding 1 and dividing by the new power, this dividing by 0 should kind of stop you in your tracks. And then you can go, wait. Who is that? Oh, yeah. I was supposed to do the natural log. Okay. So, here we go. So, let's wander all the way back up in here. All right. So, um, let's... Now, there were some other things that we did. We did the um, derivatives of the inverse trig functions and the hyperbolic functions and the inverse hyperbolic functions. So in the earlier derivatives, we, we covered those in this series of videos, but some people's books don't have that in this part of the course. Okay, it's like later. So I'm going to put the antiderivative of those in the next video. So in the next video, we're going to deal with the antiderivatives of the inverse trig hyperbolics and um, inverse hyperbolics in the next video. So I'm not going to cover that right now. Okay. And if you didn't cover that at all in your course, then you're going to skip that next video. All right. So all we really know now is we know how to reverse the power rule. Right. And um, we know certain types that we have to recognize, like you're going to have to recognize if it's got X on the bottom or x to the minus 1, you know that's a natural log. You're going to have to recognize and be able to work through uh, the trig functions backwards. So recognizing special forms and the power rule reversing it, that's all we have going for us. Okay? So let's look at what if I have the derivative of cotangent, co cotangent x cosecant x minus the cube root of x plus 2 over 3x minus 3x to the negative 4. Okay? Now, here you go. And I just sort of make up problems and throw everything, kind of like everything but the kitchen sink expression in there and just say, okay, let's do a whole bunch. Okay, so you, you have to sit there and go, okay, trig functions, trig functions. What did I take the derivative of to get cotangent cosecant? Well, the derivative of cosecant would have been cotangent cosecant. The only problem with it is, is it would have been negative, right? So if I have a positive, I somehow negated this negative, correct? So what if I had a negative cosecant? So if it was a negative cosecant, I would have the, this negative and then the negative that comes with the derivative. That's kind of messy, but I think you get the point. Okay, so that what you would have is the derivative of a negative cosecant is this negative, and the derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent or cotangent cosecant, right? So you have to have the negative in there to reverse it and minus. Just like derivatives didn't understand roots, they understand powers. You have to remember how all that works. So this is actually x to the one third. So you, so what do you do if you have x to the one third? You add one to the power. Okay, so one third plus one, one third plus three thirds is four thirds. So this is four thirds on the bottom. Some students are very comfortable with fractions and some are not, okay? If you are comfortable with fractions, you can just jump to the end. We're going to flip it, okay? And skip this intermediate step. But if not, okay, it goes like this. 
slow and right is better than fast and wrong. Okay, so here we go. Plus two thirds. Now wait a minute. This is that x in the bottom, right? So this would actually be like x to the minus one. Remember when you added one and divided by the new power, you're dividing by zero. So this is the natural log of x, right? Minus three, x, add one to the power, divide by the new power. Don't forget the plus c, right? So this is minus cosecant x, cosecant, minus three-fourths x to the four-thirds plus two-thirds natural log of x plus x to the minus three plus c. Remember, every time you leave that plus c off, I've actually met some teachers who make the whole thing wrong. I mean, no partial credit at all. Like I said, I take off two points because you're negating an entire family. All right. Now, remember when we did um, derivatives? We didn't know anything when we got started except the power rule. So anything that looked kind of not like the power rule, we had to see if we could make it be the power rule. So if you're going to reverse something that looks like it could have been the quotient rule, maybe, okay, then you have to figure out a way to make it be only the power rule because that's all you know, right? So we could split this up since this is a monomial on the bottom. And you can only do this if it's a monomial on the bottom. If it's a binomial or whatever, you have to use partial fractions or use a different technique, okay? We're not doing partial fractions. <laughs> okay, so here you go. So, but I can repeat this common denominator. Like this. And sometimes students will think they've actually finished it after this next step, but we haven't and we haven't done the antiderivative derivative yet. I started to call it integration because that's what we're doing, but it's the antiderivative. So x cubed over x squared is x plus 5x over x squared is 5 over x minus 4 over x squared. Now, you might be more comfortable saying it's x to the minus 1 minus 4x to the minus 2. But again, we have not actually done the antiderivative yet. <clears throat> so here we go. All right, so if we have just an x, we add 1 to the power. We divide by the new power, plus 5. Now remember, if it was over x or x to the minus 1, it must have originally been a natural log because you can't divide by 0. Minus 4 x minus 2 plus 1 over minus 1 plus c. So it'd be 1 half x squared plus 5 ln x plus 4 x to the minus 1 plus c. And again, before you turn this in your t to your teacher, You should see if taking the derivative of it would get back to here. Okay? Now, the question then becomes, is there any way for me to figure out which one of these possible infinite number of family functions I actually have. Is there a way to come up with an exact number for C as opposed to some generic placekeeper where C could be anything? You know, is there some way that I can I can determine what C is? And yes, there is, right? Somebody just has to give you some information. So if you look right here, here's a whole series of possible um, graphs, okay, for 4x for cubed after you do the ant antiderivative, I just need to know which one. So if they would give me a point, and it's kind of hidden right here, but this is 1, 5. The one's actually on the 
on the y-axis, so it's kind of hard to see. But if somebody would give you a specific point, you could say, oh, it's that one, because that's the one that goes through there. Okay? All right. So let's see how we would go about trying to figure out which one of these I have if I know that I want the one that goes through 1, 5. Right? So let's look at... The derivative is 16x cubed, and f of 1 is 5. Now notice that f of 1 is 5 relates not to the derivative, but to the original function. Okay, so that's a piece of information for the original, not for the derivative. So let's do the antiderivative. So we'd have 16x, add 1 to the power, divide by the new power plus c. Now here, quickly, I'm going to quit actually showing you like that 3 plus 1. I'll say it still, but I'm going to quit showing it to you. But if you're not quite ready to, to do that part in your mind, then stop the video, put that in, and then restart the video. Okay, so this would be add 1 to the power, so that'd be 4, divide by the new power. So 4 goes into 16, 4 times x to the fourth plus c. Again, double check, okay, to make sure that you took the antiderivative correctly. There's no point in doing a whole bunch of work just to find out later that you made one little mistake and you need to start over. So now that we have the original function, I'm going to apply that information that we had that said f of 1 is equal to 5. So remember, this is x. And this is telling you what y is, right? So we would go 5 is 4, x is 1, plus c. All right? So 5 equals 4 plus c. c is equal to 1. So the one that's mine out of that infinite number of family functions is the 4x to the 4th plus 1. One. <laughs> okay. I know. There's kind of a mouthful there. All right. So you hang in there okay so far? I know it's a, it's a bit much. All right. A bit much to keep up with. So let's try a few more. And then we'll, we'll say, okay, I think you've got it. And we'll do a couple of applications or a couple of more difficult ones. I know that you may be getting bored with how this goes, but better to get bored with it and be really familiar than to be going, okay, I still don't get it. Okay. So what if I have the derivative is 2 thirds x to the fifth minus 4x cubed plus 1 fourth x squared minus x plus a third. And I tell you that for the original function, when x is 0, y is negative 3. Now remember, this is information, according to what they told me, that for the original function, because there's no prime there, so I have to integrate it first. Or I should say antiderivative. Okay, now, so you might want to stop the video and do it yourself and see if you get the same thing and then restart it. Okay? So here we go, 2 thirds x. You add 1 to the power, 5 plus 1 is 6, divide by the new power. Okay, minus 4x. Add 1 to the power, 3 plus 1 is 4, divided by 4, plus 1 fourth x. Add 1 to the power, 2 plus 1 is 3, divide by the new power, minus x. Add 1 to the power, 1 plus 1 is 2, divided by 2, plus, and if you have a constant 1 third, it must have been a 1 third x, and then you have plus c. So cleaning this up just a teensy bit, okay, you have 2 goes into 6, 3 times, so you have 1 ninth x to the 6 minus x to the 4th, plus, let's try to be consistent, 1 12th x cubed 
minus one half x squared plus one third x plus c. And again, check this and make sure that if you took the derivative of that, you would get the original information that was given to you. And now we're going to apply this particular information for the specific function that I want. So y is negative 3 equals 1 ninth x is 0. I love it when x is 0 because the math turns out to be so so much better. <laughs> Minus or easier. 0 is 4 plus 1 12 0 cubed minus 1 half 0 squared plus 1 third 0 plus c. And actually that happens quite a bit, right? Because this is 0, negative 3. That's the y-intercept. Okay, so they often give that to you. Thank goodness. So c turns out to be negative 3. So the original function must be 1 ninth x to the 6 minus x to the 4th plus 1 twelfth x cubed minus 1 half x squared plus 1 third x plus, not plus, minus 3. Now, aren't you kind of proud of yourself? I mean, really, there's a lot in here. So, think back to where, what it looked like at the very first day of calculus class, you know, and you were like, oh my goodness. Okay, so look, really well done. All right. Now, let's try something a little bit more crazy. And let's say, can we back up more than just the first derivative? Yep. So we could, they could start us off with the second derivative or the third derivative or the fourth derivative or whatever. And you, if you had the fourth derivative, you would back it up to the third, then you would back it up to the second, then you would back it up to the first, and then you back that up to the original function. So it's just repeated add one to the power, divide by the new power. All right, here we go. So if it's the second derivative, I just have to do this twice, right, to get back to my original function. So here, here we go. Notice they didn't give me any information. So I cannot pick a specific function out of that infinite number of shifted up and down family functions. Okay, so, but I can definitely back this up. So you'd have three x, add one to the power, divide by the new power, minus 4x, add 1 to the power, divide by the new power, plus 6x, add 1 to the power, divide by the new power, minus 7, and if it's a constant now, it must have been an x, and don't forget the constant that would have been there. Okay, so this is 3 fifths x to the fifth minus x to the fourth, plus 3x squared minus 7x plus c. And what you should do is go, if I took the derivative of what I just wrote down, would I get 3x to the fourth minus 4x cubed plus 6x minus 7? Yes, you would. Okay, I'm just going to underline this so we can get back to where we were. So now we're going to look at this one, and we're going to take the antiderivative again. So here's f now. 3 fifths. Okay, so we have x. Add 1 to the power, divide by the new power, minus x. Add 1 to the power, divide by the new power, plus 3. x. Add 1 to the power, divide by the new power, minus 7. x. Add 1 to the power, divide by the new power, plus. Now, if you had a constant now, it must have had an x to begin with, right? But now I need a new constant, so let's call it d. Now, some books and some teachers will say this, call this c1 and call this c2, and, and that's nothing wrong with that. I just found that my students, um, sometimes this, the ones and twos drop off and then they get lost, or sometimes they don't notice them. So I want them to do C and D so that it's definitely not the same C. All right. So but again, you'll do what your teacher asks you to do or what your book's trying to get you to do. All right. So CX plus D. 
So this was the first constant I tried to retrieve that I'm not sure what it is. And this is the second one. Now, if I was going to try to figure out this specific one that I have, I would need two sets of information. One to find out what C is and one to find out what D is. Because remember, if you have two unknowns, you need two equations, right? Okay. Now, let's clean this up a little bit. So 3 goes into 6 twice. So you'd have 1 tenth x to the 6th minus 1 fifth x to the 5th plus the 3's cancel, x cubed minus 7 halves x squared plus cx plus d. And again, if you want to put the denominators underneath those x to the 6, x to the squareds or whatever, absolutely, I would be okay with that. Depends on your teacher and whoever's grading your homework, whether it's a person or whether it's um, a TA or your teacher or whatever. Okay. So here we go. So this is what it would look like if I was going to try to find the original equation. Okay. So if we were going to try to find the exact function and they told me, well, the slope function goes through this point, okay? And the original function itself goes through here. So you have to pay attention. Hey, this is this is the first derivative. And this is the original function. Okay? So be careful where you're putting this information. All right? So let's take the antiderivative. So you'd have 12x, add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. Now, some of y'all can probably do some of this in your head, and it's lovely, and it's wonderful, okay? But some of us can't, okay? So I'm going to keep showing it like this. Feel free to skip whatever you want. Plus 18x squared over 2 minus, <coughs> excuse me, 8x and some constant, right? So this is... 4x cubed plus 9x squared minus 8x plus c. Now, here we go. So I've got my cleaned up first derivative, and I'm going to apply that piece of information that says the first derivative has this point on its graph, where x is 0 and y is 2. So 2 equals 4 times 0 cubed plus 9 times 0 squared minus a times 0 plus c. All those wipe out, so c is 2. So f prime is 4x cubed plus 9x squared minus 8x plus 2. Doing OK? Now, you can always go and check this and say, OK, if this is the first derivative and I take the derivative of that, would I get that back? Looks like it to me, okay? So I'm feeling pretty good about what I'm doing. Now, I'm not terribly sure about two, maybe, but assuming you can do all this part right in here correctly, you're doing well. So now we're going to do the antiderivative again. So I of this one, we're going to do the antiderivative of the one right here underlined. So you have four x, add one to the power, divide by the new power, plus nine x, add 1 to the power, divide by the new power, minus 8x, add 1 to the power, divide by the new power, plus 2, and if it's currently a 2, it must have had an x with it before, and some new function, let's call it d, because I already used c. So f of x is x to the fourth, plus 3, because the 3 goes into 9 3 times, x cubed, minus 4x squared plus 2x plus d. And remember that they told us way back up there at the top that f of negative 1 equals negative 7. So x is negative 1, y is negative 7. So negative 7 equals negative 1 to the 4th 
plus 3 times negative 1 cubed minus 4 times negative 1 squared plus 2 times negative 1 plus d. Okay, so negative 7 is 1 minus 3 minus 4 minus 2 plus d. So minus 7 minus 9 minus 8. So when you add 8 to both sides, you have d is 1. So your exact original equation is x to the fourth plus 3x cubed minus 4x squared plus 2x plus 1. Okay, and you can take the derivative of that twice and see if that gets you back to the original second derivative that they gave you. Let's try another one. I know this is kind of a long video, but if this is so important. If you can get comfortable with this whole concept, it makes the rest of what's coming so much easier. Okay. So here we go. So if I back this up, okay, I took the derivative of something and got cosine. So what, what did I take the derivative of? Because you have to recognize these. You can't go add 1 to the power. So I must have taken the derivative of sine because the derivative of sine is cosine, right? Now, I took the derivative of something and got sine. Now, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, right? The derivative of cosine would be negative sine. But I don't have a negative. I have a positive. So if this had been a negative, I would have a negative of a negative, which is positive. Okay, so this must have been negative cosine theta. Can you kind of follow that logic? Okay, so slow it down and think it through if it's kind of going, what? Okay, think it through and make sure you're good with that. Okay, plus C. Okay. And this is a piece of information that goes with the derivative. So we're going to apply f prime of 0 equals 4. So 4 equals sine of 0 minus cosine of 0 plus c. So 4 is sine of 0 is 0, cosine of 0 is 1 plus c, so c is 5. So f prime of theta is sine of theta minus cosine theta plus 5. Okay, so we're down to here. You can take the derivative of that and make sure that it gets to here to double check yourself. And you should get into a habit of doing that all the time. Okay, now we're going to try to find the original function. Back it up again. So if I took the derivative of something and got a positive sign, not a negative sign, I got a positive sign, this must have been a negative cosine. Okay? And I, I took the derivative and got cosine, so it would have been a negative, and the derivative of sine is cosine. Okay? If it's a constant now, if it's 5, it must have been 5 theta to start. And then you have some unknown constant. And we're going to apply the information that f of 0 is equal to 3 or the, from the original function. So 3 is negative cosine of 0 minus sine of 0 plus 5 times 0 plus d. <laughs> okay, so 3 is negative. Cosine of 0 is 1 minus sine of 0 is 0. 5 times 0 is 0 plus d. So d turns out to be 4. Okay, so the original exact function is minus cosine theta minus sine theta plus 5 theta plus 4. So you should be able to take this one and take the derivative and make sure that you get it back up there to the first one. All right. Now, 
but I actually think since this is already at an hour, I think I'm going to split this one into the remainder of make it a part two because it's, it's getting kind of a little bit long. So we're going to have a part two and then the next video will be the inverse trig and the hyperbolics and the inverse hyperbolics. So don't forget that at the um, down in the bottom in the description, there's links to practice problems and there's um, links to the next video. Apologize for telling you the next video was going to be hyperbolics. I just really hadn't thought this one's going to go quite this long and I try to keep them under an hour. So we'll stop this video for now. There'll be a part two to this video and up not too long after this one, I hope. And thank you. I'll see you at the next video.